movement and cognition are sort of all the part of the same continuum. I don't think the brain makes the separation between, you know, higher level cognition and movement. Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 115 of the Stroke Cast. The two most recommended books I see in the stroke community are My Stroke of Insight by Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor and Stronger After Stroke by Pete Levine. If stroke survivors actually got a welcome basket along with their MRIs and CT scans, these books would be in it. And today, well, I am practically giddy to share my conversation with researcher, teacher, speaker, blogger, best-selling author, and physical therapist, Pete Levine. So let's get right to it and meet Pete. Pete, thanks so much for joining us on the show this week. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Bill. <laughs> you know, I am, I'm thrilled to have you on. I've read the book and a lots of other folks have recommended the book. So I guess the first thing I want to ask is, how did you get into stroke research? What was it about this field that was so appealing to you? Well, Bill, I'd like to give you a really interesting and compelling answer to that, but I just kind of fell into it. <laughs> Um, it is true, now I should go back and say that it is true that I have a sister who had brain injury years ago. We lived in New Jersey. She was coming back from a Christmas vacation, driving on the New Jersey Turnpike, and her car flipped a bunch. She ended up in a hospital in a coma for the next three months, and she's doing fine. And so maybe that maybe that is the way where it started. I mean, she went on after that, and I was just thinking about this the other day. Her IQ went up after her brain injury, and she had a significant brain injury. Our, our IQs tend to go up from about high school when they first take it to uh, early adulthood, and then they kind of, when you get to be my age, it kind of levels off a little bit. Mm. Um, maybe we become better test takers. I don't know. Mm. But her IQ went up. She uh, went on and got a master's degree. Uh, got married, had a couple of kids, and now she's very wealthy living in Houston. So maybe that did inform me early on about the way I felt about brain injury and the brain. After I uh, graduated with a degree in physical therapy, I got a call from the Kessler Institute. Now, this is in New Jersey. Kessler is usually the first or second highest rated rehab hospital in the country. And I get this random phone call do you want to come and do clinical research? We're doing research into stroke here at Kessler. Do you want to come join us? And I was like, I didn't know anything about clinical research, but it was Kessler, so I had to go. So I went, I got interviewed by a guy who's still a colleague of mine, Stephen Page, who is now a professor of occupational therapy. Prior to my degree in physical therapy, I was a musician. Prior to him getting involved, my colleague Steve, he was a competitive swimmer, Division I, University of Tennessee. So you can imagine two people, one who is a musician, one who is an athlete, who is really interested in recovery from stroke. So what do we lean on? We looked at the stuff that was used traditionally in rehab, and we kind of didn't like it. It had to do with handling techniques and trying to get reflexes to work better, and all this sort of old school stuff that didn't resonate with us. What did resonate with us was a treatment option that had just come out called constraint-induced therapy, developed by a neuropsychologist named Dr. Edward Taub, who now runs the Taub Clinic for Constraint-Induced Therapy at University of Alabama, Birmingham. Steve was a swimmer, very high level swimmer. I was a musician. I was in a band that was signed to a major label and MTV and touring and the whole thing. We both knew what practice was. I mean, this is what musicians love to do. We actually like to practice. And athletes, good ones, love to practice. So we thought that constraint induced therapy was a good first place to go. The second thing we looked at was another adjunctive therapy called mental practice. And that's where you try to get the stroke survivor to remember the way that they moved 
prior to their stroke. You're accessing something called a motor schema or a motor engram. It's the memory of the movement. So if a stroke survivor is trying to relearn how to walk after their stroke, you would have them not only work with a clinician to regain their walking, but then in the off time, they would calmly do deep breathing, get a little zen about it, close their eyes, and start to remember how they felt walking prior to their stroke. They then access that memory, and we found through various ways of imaging the brain that you could activate the same part of the brain if you imagine walking as if you actually walk. And the newer research now says that if you observe somebody else walking, the portion of your brain that activates when you walk, activate. So if you think about it, if you do it, or if you watch somebody else doing it, all three of those drive brain changes. So that's I, that's a really long answer, Bill. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. There's a ton of stuff to unpack in there. I think uh, one of the first things that comes to mind is you talk about how you fell into uh, stroke research. I think a lot of folks in our community and yep. a lot of survivors, we kind of fell into this area too, but perhaps in a more literal context. Yes, yes. <laughs> I also think it's really interesting when you talk about being a musician and being able to connect with that and the things we're learning about music and stroke recovery now and and how it can help folks with aphasia by bypassing traditional language centers and even a few yeah. weeks ago i was talking with brian harris from med rhythms where they're actually using rhythm now to help people develop a smoother gait absolutely there's a, a this is these are treatments that go back decades there's a treatment Originally, it was called bilateral arm training with rhythmic auditory cueing. And Jill Whittall, a, a professor of physical therapy at University of Maryland, Baltimore campus, started uh, developing these machines that added a metronomal click to recovery. And you can see how that might be compelling with the upper extremity, where one extremity is doing something either in an equal and opposite or equal and at the same time kind of movement. What we find in those cases is that the good side trains the bad side of the brain in real time. So if you move, um, Bill, you are a left hemi, is that correct? That is correct. So typically what we would find is if you use both limbs, your good side limb, your right side limb will inform in real time your left side limb and the left side limb will move better. Now, obviously, in walking, that automatically happens. You don't have to come up with a machine to do that. Walking is inherently bilateral. It is also inherently rhythmic. So anybody using that stuff, I'm all for anything that involves mm -hmm. drums. Love the drums. <laughs> Yep. Awesome. Yeah, I find that lately I'm uh, at the point now where I can try to make that conscious effort that when I take a uh, step forward with my right leg to try to consciously move my left arm forward as well to match that sort of natural swinging mechanism, which it took me a while to realize uh, after the stroke that, oh, yeah, I don't have that arm swing with legs anymore because we don't think about moving the arms with the legs just in normal normal life right it's it's a natural part of gait and it really makes gait a lot more efficient and let's not mess around with this human beings walked the entire planet from east africa all the way up to finland so um walking is a really important part of what we do um i also i think i saw an interview with you someplace maybe it was on your website or YouTube, I'm not sure where it was, but you were wearing a sling on that left side shoulder. Are, are you still wearing that? No, I did that for about 15 months. Uh, once I had the upper arm strength that I wasn't subluxing nearly as much, I ditched the sling. Even when I was wearing the sling, though, I started doing everything I could to make my left arm work, including I just mounted a pocket on the sling so that my left arm wasn't getting to just take a break. Uh-huh. So how's the subluxation going? I don't think it's an issue anymore. Uh, maybe there's a little bit of visual subluxation that I can kind of think I see. 
but I'm not having any pain or restrictions from the movement of doing that. I can pretty much fully rotate my shoulder now. Good. And may I ask, if you don't mind, and I know this is a clinician inside me, but (laughs) how is the left hand doing? Are you able to grasp and release? I am just now getting a little bit more release. I was able to sort of start grasping uh, with a delay in the hospital. The release has taken some more time. But what I have observed is that it's been continuing to come back over the past three years or so. A little bit more, you know, essentially every day. Um, You talked about visualization earlier. One of the things I was doing early on was just sort of laying in bed at night, just sort of trying to visualize moving my left index finger. And uh, not looking at it, I started to think I was actually getting some movement and maybe I was. And all of that stuff can make a difference. But uh, I am definitely getting the uh, my, my, my progress has definitely been from center out, though I know that's not how everybody experiences it. Uh, and my Dysport and Botox has also been quite helpful in releasing some of that tone and spasticity. Uh-huh. Yeah, actually, the the center out it, we, in rehab, we call that proximal to distal recovery. <laughs> we get very mm-hmm. technical with these terms. And you're absolutely right. It, it sometimes doesn't happen that way. So uh, pretty, pretty cool, pretty uh, observant of you. Well, when I was in the hospital, one of the things that I found uh, was sort of one of the keys to my, my – one of the things that helped with my recovery was – I realized I've got these these therapists who are working with me, these OTs and PTs, and they've spent tens of thousands of dollars on their education. I'm spending, or my insurance company is spending tens of thousands of dollars, a couple hundred for me to actually be there. I'm going to learn as much as I can from them. So when I was, when we were taking those rests between exercises or even while we were doing, I was asking as many questions as I could to learn what is happening, what's going on, what, what is, uh, Valsalva? What is hyperextension? How do we deal with this? Why is this a concern? Why does this matter? Uh, so I was lucky enough to be bored enough and still have my cognitive skills to be able to try and extract as much as I possibly could from them. Right. And I bet if they were good therapists, they were also learning from stroke survivors that they had treated before you. I, I've i found, you know, uh, that um, there's actually a portion of my book dedicated to what I call super survivors, these people who are discharged from therapy and they realize that that discharge is not the beginning of the end, but the end of the beginning. And they realize that that first plateau that happens, it's an artifact of something that happens in the brain. It gets technical. It's the resolution of the penumbra. But that big plateau that precipitates discharge from therapy isn't the end of recovery. And you've you've already talked about this, that things have happened since then and you're you're real conscious of maybe you have some finger extension now. What happens is they hit that plateau, they're discharged from therapy, and they say, I, I can't deal with this. I, I don't have enough to, I haven't recovered enough to go back to do what I need to do in my life. So they then chip away at these other smaller, granted smaller plateaus, but really important to their recovery. And then we get right back to musicians. That's the same way musicians chip away at learning their instrument or an athlete chips away at you know, becoming better at a sport. We all do this every day, I think. I think this is part of life, right? We're all chipping away at these plateaus that people have thrown up and said, that's as far as you can go. So, yeah, I bet they've learned a lot from from stroke survivors as well. I think so. I'm still in touch with uh, several of them, which oh, okay, is good. which is a delight. A couple of things that are really interesting there. I generally don't use the term plateau when I talk to folks. I prefer to think of it as... You know, sort of the landing in the stairwell on a skyscraper. Exactly. It's a place to rest, to take a break, to assess where you're at, and then to keep on moving up. It's not the end. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Testify. That's right. I I completely agree. And what a great time to rest. You know, you're on this plateau and you're like, what do I do next? You know, athletes call that habituation. If you do the same stuff, you're going to get the same outcomes. 
So that landing on the staircase gives you a great opportunity to look at what else can I do here? Okay, so I plateaued there. Maybe I can do something else over here. So I think it's a great idea. Yep. <laughs> I, I think the other thing that's really interesting when you talk about all these repetitions, two things come to mind there too is that it's within the last 20 years or so outside of stroke research that Malcolm Gladwell popularized the idea of it takes 10,000 hours of deliberate practice in order to become an expert at something and talking about athletics and musicians and things like that. And yes, I know there are a lot of problems with that analysis, but <laughs> it, as a concept, I think more people are open to that. And um, when you start talking about the reps in therapy, I think there's a lot of alignment there. Yeah, I'm a big Malcolm Gladwell fan. So you hit on a good one for me. <laughs> and, and maybe he was the first to sort of popularize that idea I, I actually have it. I'm just looking at my bookcase. It's the Cambridge Handbook of Expert Performance. Wait, and Expert Performance. It's a 1,200-page book about what Malcolm Gladwell was talking about. And at least he, he popularized it. I think there's some value there. Malcolm Gladwell is a, a guy who, who does deep research and then popularizes concepts that are already in the research. I think that's great. I mean, we need people like that. I, I can tell you that in stroke, they've done a really good job of figuring out the number of repetitions. And I do have a blog, and I'll, I'll have a chance, I'm sure, to tell you where to find that blog. But on there, there's a, there's a little link. It's, it's seminar stuff on my blog, and uh, it's the Stronger After Stroke blog. And, um, and on there, you'll find the articles that delineate the number of repetitions that a stroke survivor would have to do in order to get better. And the way they define getting better was increases in active range of motion at a single joint. So in, in clinical research, we're real interested in just one small thing at a time. And the first thing that these series of labs looked at was how many repetitions would a stroke survivor have to do to get more active range of motion in a single joint. But, but they also wanted to see how many repetitions would also be involved for the brain, that portion of the brain dedicated to that movement to expand. And that technology that we use to scan the brain is almost always functional magnetic resonance imaging. It measures the amount of blood flow, and I'm sure you've seen, seen these kinds of scans. You have MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, it's a great, beautiful picture of the brain. And then they say, how much blood is flowing to a certain portion of the brain as a person tries to move, as a stroke survivor tries to move that joint? So for those two things to happen, those two phenomena to happen, that is more increase in the brain dedicated to the movement and more movement, the number that they're kind of playing with is about 1,200 repetitions. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to have perfect movement in that joint. That just means that they're going to get a little bit more active range of motion. So 1,200 understand in a single joint means that for most movements that you do, like walking has crazy numbers of joints. There's toe joints involved and there's ankle joints in eversion and, and dorsiflexion, plantar flexion and inversion. Then there's knee extension, there's hip extension and abduction and adduction. Not to mention all the upper extremity stuff that you were talking about. So it's not like 1,200 will get you better walking. You're gonna, we're talking about 1,200 at the ankle, 1,200 at the knee, 1,200 at the hip. It gets uh, to be a lot of repetition. And you can imagine how you would run out of time in rehab and run out of money if you had to spend all that time only having a therapist you know, guide you through those repetitions. So now I think we've come full circle. We've talked about therapists, their involvement, Malcolm Gladwell, and all the repetitions that you have to do to really get, really get better. It's hard work after stroke, absolutely. Absolutely. And when you have uh, lower energy levels anyway due to neurofatigue, and of course it's impossible to get a good night's sleep in a hospital or rehab facility context anyway. The other thing that I, I remember talking about a lot was my background is actually in uh, – learning and development uh, and adult education and training. Uh -huh. And there's a lot of overlap between those two fields. But at the same time, we're talking about what we're learning in rehab. 
it is so opposed to what we learn about in adult education. The idea of doing something on rote repetition is anathema in most adult education contexts because they say adults don't learn that way. And it's like, hmm. You know, I think this is really not necessarily true based on how I learned to walk at age 46. <laughs> so I think there's some interesting things happening in that space. Yeah. The, the one caveat I would say is like it, most of the adult training or, or learning that you're talking about, I wonder if it's not in some ways more expansive than motor learning. I mean, let's face it. You're not trying to work on a jump shot right now. What you're trying to do is open your fingers. It's pretty simple. Well, simple is not a good word. <laughs> it's very difficult because the portion of the brain dedicated to your finger extensors is broken. Right. You may very well have to borrow from some completely disparate part of the brain. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I think it's, it's different than an adult learner who's going into a new por phase of their career and trying to learn a whole a big rainbow of different things, I think mm. maybe a little bit different. So in, in that regard, motor learning at this level is um, a little bit simpler than maybe the stuff that you were doing with your adult learners. Maybe, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think there's a lot more overlap than we tend to think, but you're right, there is some very different higher level or different level types of things that are happening there. Uh, one thing that this whole experience has taught me is that that whole line we draw, at least popularly, between physical conditions and mental conditions is a heck of a lot fuzzier than uh, the popular culture would have you believe. One of the things that really bothers me, and it's like one of those nerdy researcher things that bothers me, um, is when people talk about cognition, they go, well, you know, you talk a lot about, because I do CEU talks, continuing education talks to mm -hmm. therapists, and I've done them for years. And they'll, somebody will raise their hand and they'll say, you know, you're talking a lot about movement, but what about cognition? Well, movement is cognitive. It's the original form of cognition. Long before as human beings, we were speaking or playing music or doing math or whatever. We were in an ever-changing outdoor environment moving. So movement, I, I th just to your point, you were talking about how like movement and cognition are sort of all the part of the same continuum. I don't think the brain makes the separation between, you know, higher level cognition and movement. It's changing the structure and or function of neurons in your cortex, a particular part of the outside shell of the brain. And that same, that same process happens whether you're trying to relearn how to open your hand or I'm trying to learn algebra, which, trust me, would be a real mess. And you could probably become an NBA player before I'll be able to do algebra. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but it's all in the same part of the brain. And I think, to your point, it, we make a mistake when we separate all these things. The brain doesn't. Why should we? Very true. So, I mean, to that point, when we start talking about movement as a form of cognition and we start looking at a lot of these different things. A lot of things we've talked about, and you've talked about in the book, around constraint-induced therapy and around working with the motor cortex and, and all of these different skills and, and things. How can these uh, treatments or concepts behind them also inform then treatment of things like visual field cuts or sensory processing or the emotional regulation, or some of those other things we typically think of around cognitive deficits? Yeah, well, so um, let me just go back. I teach in a, in a PT program um, uh, around the corner from my house. I was doing some research for one of the classes I was looking at. It turns out, you know how, like, you think about infants, and they're in the womb, and it's really dark, and then they come out, and all of a sudden... Their visual cortex, which is at the back of the brain in the occipital lobe, it hasn't been challenged because they've been in this dark environment, and so they don't really have an opportunity to wire their brain. Well, it turns out that's not true. In the womb, infants open their eyes. They'll turn their head towards a source of light. 
So even in the womb, outside of the womb, visual, just because you mentioned visual stuff, if somebody has a visual deficit after a brain injury, the same neuroplastic rules are in play that are in play with you trying to open your And again, I, I think we make these separations between vision and then we get speech and that's supposed to be separate. And one of the things that our lab found was that we found, we did a study with a few speech therapists um, and they were sort of co-authors on it. We found that as hand movement got better, speech got better. Now, what's the connection there? I mean, you could look at where speech is on the homunculus, the point-to-point representation on the brain, like the, the, the body map on, on the brain. And yeah, the mouth is very close to the hands. Um, but really, it's because we express ourselves with hand movements. I was just watching um, Barack Obama on a, on a podcast on YouTube. Uh, today, and he's like super expressive with his hands. There is no dissection or, or, or a cordoning off of the visual cortex and the hands and speech and all these other things. And music is a great example of this. I have some great videos of people in fMRI listening to music. Man, there's no part of the brain that isn't lighting up. Does the visual cortex light up when you listen to music that you love? Heck yeah. Because you imagine things. You might see waves or armies or whatever the heck you're listening to. I don't know. Uh, Motor portions of the brain light up because people think about dance and movement. Um, The intellectual parts, the frontal lobe lights up, everything. Even the cerebellum that's involved in balance lights up. So I think we we make too much of of coordinating off the brain. But yeah, the visual cortex is is really quite neuroplastic. And there's a lot that you can do to remediate problems after stroke with people that have vision problems. I'm not, it's not my area of expertise, but there are quite a few things that you can do. And that's one of those things that gets really interesting then too, getting way out of my field of expertise here. I think when we start then looking at ideas like the impact of stroke or what happens with folks who primarily communicate via things like American Sign Language or other uh, signing things is, are, are there challenges then related to motor cortex, to language centers, and some of those things, because all that then comes together. Yeah. I mean, isn't it interesting, as soon as we can't speak, we turn, turn to our hands. Yeah, you made my point. Thank you very much. Perfect. Appreciate it, Bill. Sure. <laughs> so, I, I mean, you've been putting all this stuff stuff together and making all this stuff. Uh, actually, when we start talking about differentiation among where different things are working, how the brain is all working together, one of the things you talk about in the book as well is how decisions are often made at the level of the spinal cord, which is something we don't most people outside the field don't traditionally think of as part of the brain. Could you talk a little bit about the role of the spinal cord in decision-making or in engaging the body? Um, absolutely. So there is a hero of mine. Her name is uh, Singye Brunstrom. Uh, she passed away in the early 90s. Um, she was a physical therapist, Swedish, a Fulbright scholar, very bright. And she changed the way we looked at stroke recovery. She also happened to work at the Kessler Institute where I worked, but she worked there before I did. It was always a big thrill that she worked there. Um, I'm a little bit of hero worship here. Okay, so I'm going to get over this. So she um, had come up with, after observing hundreds and hundreds of stroke survivors, she came up with a test to tell where they were in the arc of recovery. It's this very elegant arc. It has six stages. And the first stage, uh, the person is right after their stroke, and they're usually flaccid on their affected side. There's no muscle tone. There's no nothing. And then the sixth stage, they're perfect, like they were before their stroke. Now, some people stall at some point in that arc. What we found, and what others have found, is that if you look at Brunstrom stages, and you use a paper and pencil test to figure out where what stage they're in, 
we can now use modern brain scanning technology, including uh, fMRI and transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is something that our lab uh, looked at, to correlate her score, her paper and pencil score, to the fMRI data to the transcranial magnetic stimulation. So this person was a genius. I mean, understand she came up with this test decades before MRI even, let alone fMRI, but MRI even came into hospitals. So, and one of the things that she said was a huge milestone in a stroke survivor's recovery was the emergence of spinal reflexes. And, um, and spinal reflexes come from the spinal cord. So a, a classic reflex is, let's go patellar tendon. You know, the, the doc takes the tomahawk, uh, <laughs> uh, shaped, um, a hammer and taps you on the patellar tendon just below your knee and the, and the, uh, lower leg kicks forward. Those are the first things to emerge after a stroke. Those come from the spinal cord, not from the brain. It's almost like the spinal cord is an immature brain that is trying to scream at the world, hey, the brain is just behind me. He's still asleep. He's kind of lazy. I'm trying to wake him up. But in the meantime, we got some spinal stuff that we can that we can use uh, maybe to help you a little bit. It's something that's lost on a lot of clinicians. Let me ask you something, Bill. Have you had trouble walking at all? Um, I still uh, have trouble walking smoothly. I, when I'm out in the real world, I still wear my AFO and walk with a cane around the, ho- the, uh, the house. I don't, but my gait is still wonky. It takes more energy and uh, I don't walk as quickly as I used to. But I can get around okay, just fine. I hear you. So, and sometimes that AFO, it's just the last thing you want to do when you're just going around the house. I completely understand. Sometimes when you go outside the house, you probably don't even want to put it on. It's such a hassle. <laughs> if if I'm if I'm going less than say 200 feet outside, I I often don't bother to deal with it. Well, that yeah, that's good, and it's probably not bad to take that AFO every once in, off every once in a while because you don't know what's changed. Maybe, right. maybe something changed. Maybe. I, I'm, I'm on my third one as I've progressed through different levels of needing needing the support. So I see it as an outside thing, as it's more of a safety thing, uh, as I don't want to have any little bit of drag or as I get more fatigued from just being out and about uh, of having to work harder to not, not have the foot drop. And that's more likely to happen after I've been out for an hour or so. Yeah, I... I completely understand. One of the things that that happens is before you have any dorsiflexion, and I know you know what this is, but just to describe it Mm -hmm. um, to your listeners, um, it's the ability to lift the foot at the ankle. So toes up, um, that movement. Plantar flexion is the opposite one. That's foot down or toes down. And that you usually don't have to worry about because you've got these ginormous muscles, the gastroc and the soleus, and they're super powerful. And up against this and, tiny and, little muscle, the tibialis anterior. And while and you've got gravity too. And you've got, and you're against gravity. That's right. I forgot about that one. So so you've got these two huge muscles pushing the foot down, and often they're spastic. And then you got this tiny little muscle working against gravity, and these two big bullies on the other side, antagonist muscles. They're literally called antagonist muscles and uh and so um so one of the things i try to teach clinicians is is something called the modified ashworth which is a a way of testing spasticity and you hold the 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 foot into dorsiflexion and you bring it rapidly into plantar flexion um spasticity is velocity dependent man i'm getting into the weeds here okay it's velocity (laughs) dependent which is a fancy way of saying that spasticity won't come out to play unless you move the limb or the joint fast. How fast? The entire range of motion within one second. So if the first thing a therapist should do, instead of slapping an AFO on there, is to hold the patient or the the survivor into dorsiflexion and bring them rapidly into plantar flexion. And if that tibialis anterior is active from the spinal cord, you'll find a quick catch and release. Now, that person may still need an AFO. It's true. 
But at that point, at least when they're in the hospital in um, in like subacute situations, a rehab hospital, that's when you start things like e-stim um, and you start other things that may help that spinal cord start to speak to the brain, have the brain then speak through the spinal cord to these muscles that lift the foot. And so that's all I'm saying about how the spinal cord is involved in recovery. It is the first indicator that something is trying to get through from the central nervous system. And those are all, all come from spinal, uh, mon- what they call sp- uh, monosynaptic stretch reflexes from the spinal. I, I think one of the places people who haven't been through an experience like this may encounter that too, is the, uh, the classic example I've heard of, you know, when you accidentally touch your hand to the stove or something else that's really hot, uh, your brain doesn't tell you to pull your hand away. It's that that signal is by, you know, stops the spinal cord and immediately calls for that emergency response. Yeah. And um, so we have these spinal reflexes, but the brain is really good at inhibiting those reflexes. Things like the one that you're talking about. If you burn yourself, your brain, you know, you got a hundred billion neurons. You got a quadrillion synapse. And like the whole brain wants to get involved if you feel a lot of heat like that. So the brain's going to take a long time to process that. So what the brain does is it says, you know what? I don't even want to be involved. We're, we're arguing between different parts of the brain about what to do. Let's <laughs> just leave it to the spinal cord. And up comes your hand. It ends up in almost like a flexor synergy. It's up near your ear. And you think to yourself, man, I am the fastest man on earth. You know, I, yeah, I, I almost burned my hand, but I didn't because I am too fast for that heat. Well, that wasn't you per se. That was an organ in your hand that went to the spinal cord and immediately went back to your the muscles in your arm to pick your... So the, the brain just disinhibits that reflex. And uh, the bad news is you look like a funky chicken. Here's the good news. You don't have burnt hand because that's never good. Yep. Or if you step Very on true. a tack, you step, you're barefoot, you step on a tack, that one foot just kicks straight up and you feel like an idiot. You feel like a flamingo on acid or something. But the good news is you don't have a hole in your foot. Yep. So the and, and, and doing the funky chicken is probably good shoulder exercise anyway. You know, we. that's funny that you mentioned that. I got another story about that. So my colleague, Steve, once said, you know, why don't we try to just elicit these reflexes over and over and over again? And he said to me, you know, we keep hearing these stroke survivors who say in the morning, they stretch and they yawn and they're not even out of bed. And all of a sudden, the arm opens up and the hand opens up. And for the rest of the day, they can't do that movement. But right at the morning, before they ever get out of bed, they yawn and that hand opens up beautifully. So why don't we do that? Why don't we use those associated reactions to help drive recovery? And I said to my colleague, Steve, how are you going to get people to yawn over and over again? And he said, well, maybe we should get them to read our research. It's pretty boring. <laughs> but we, that, that was literally the, the level of the conversation that we were having in 1999 about what we can do to help stroke survivors recover. It was everything and anything that we could throw at the wall. That was right. one of the ideas. And, and even just, just getting those, uh, those actions happening, even if they weren't driving uh, necessary, necessarily brain recovery, you're at least engaging the muscles and making them do something to uh, keep them at least a little bit healthy. That is true. And there is a whole school of, of therapy. And in fact, I'm working with a professor now who – who has really taught me a lot about this stuff. Uh, she's one of my uh, program I teach in about how to elicit those kinds of things. To Okay, maybe it's not perfect movement, but it gets the survivor to the point where they can start working on perfect movement or n- not even perfect, movement, just better movement. I mean, we're, my philosophy is don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. Mm-hmm. Maybe you'll never get perfect hand movement, Bill, but we're not looking for that. We're just looking for better, but you're right. We can use those little tricks to maybe get them a little bit better so that they can get themselves a little bit better and maybe then a little bit more, a little bit more. And then the the upshot is, you know, maybe you can get your left hand involved in stuff that you do every day. 
During the uh, first six months or so after my stroke, mm. uh, one of the most endless sources of amusement for my girlfriend was yeah. when I would yawn, suddenly my left hand would go full jazz hands. <laughs> Wait, I'm trying to do chess. Yeah, I know what chess hands are. I got it. I got it. Yeah. Um, so both. And, uh, yeah. Wait, you're saying bilaterally they went jazz hands? Both sides? No, just just my left hand. My because uh, I'm what I'm guessing, and my 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 assessment at the time as just a random marketing guy who now knows way more about neurology and neuroplasticity than any marketing guy should ever know, is that. Uh, that was just a lower level function, maybe originating from the uh, spinal cord or elsewhere, that simply the brain didn't have the ability to shut down. And that if I had just sort of didn't have the natural inhibition on my unaffected side, it would do that too. But it was just sort of that default on its own going that the right hand didn't, but the uh, the left affected side did. Because my, my stroke was, uh, it, it was basically I broke my basal ganglia. So, uh -huh. uh, sort of, uh, which my understanding is that sort of centered yeah, on I, the I mean, stop and go movement in the body. Oh, okay. I see. And that, yeah. Okay. So, but one of the things I, I should point out, Bill, is that this idea mm -hmm. that you don't know stuff, I mean, you know it from mm -hmm. a different angle. Well, I think one of the problems that, that clinicians have a lot of the time is they'll They'll talk about patients that are very, very low level. Why? Because those are the patients that keep coming back. They don't see Bill anymore. Bill's out living his life. Why? <laughs> because Bill figured out a few things to allow himself to live his life. And so what they get is these repeat customers. And so they get into this fatigue where they, where I'm talking about clinicians, usually therapists, sure. also physiatrists and neurologists, though, where they keep seeing the same people that haven't recovered come back to them and i think it gives them a skewed view of the un of the stroke recovery universe and so they see those people over and over again and so of course they're going to lowball you when you say well will i ever walk again they go no you're not going to walk again if i had a nickel for every time a stroke survivor said you know my neuro said i would never walk again well you know First of all, the, the neurologist isn't paid to, to overestimate your ability. Because then if, you, if he says, yeah, you, if she says, yeah, you can walk, and then you don't walk, you're going to be like, hey, what happened here? You said I was yeah, going to walk. You're going to sue them. You're going to sue them, right? So, <laughs> so they tend to lowball anyway. But then also they have these repeat customers who don't mm. do that well. So I guess what I'm saying, Bill, is you really should write a book. <laughs> I mean, look, you could take the best of the podcasts and, and like make chapters out of that. You don't even have to write it. You could do it voice to text and, and then just say, I interviewed this guy and he said this. And it, the whole thing can write for you using modern technology. But don't discount what you know about this stuff. It's important. <laughs> that's uh that's sort of the long-term plan here. There you uh, go. Uh, you know, I, I actually started the podcast because – I wanted there to be the podcast that I wish had existed on June 3rd, 2017, when I had the stroke. I see. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a great idea. And podcasts are super popular. I wish I had gotten in into it, but I never did. But you did. That's good. You should keep it going. It's awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. So, uh, what drove you to write Stronger After Stroke? Talking about books. Well, it was a revenge trip, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> it all had to do with revenge. So, hey, uh, motivation is motivation. Whatever, whatever motivates you. That's that's the way I looked at it. So here's what happened. Um, I have a bachelor's degree. That's my highest level of degree. Um, so there's a part of the NIH it's, uh, that deals with stroke. It's called the NINDS, National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. So the NINDS is stroke. They have a whole portion of the NIH dedicated to stroke. It's such a huge problem. When George W. Bush was in power, he tended to not want to fund a lot of the stuff that was coming from the NIH. And you'll also remember our economy was in a free fall. When Barack Obama came in, one of the things he wanted to get involved in was funding what he called shovel-ready projects. And he had explicitly stated 
that one of the things that he was going to fund was a lot of the stuff from the NIH that had been lying fallow because we just didn't have the money in the economy to be able to do it. So within a two-week period, right after Obama came uh, into office, um, we got about 10 to 12, I think I'm going to have to ask Steve about this, but about 10 to 12 million dollars came into our lab. And what happened was exactly what Obama wanted to happen. We hired a bunch of people. And almost all of these people had PhDs of some sort, or they were MD PhDs, or they were epidemiologists, or they were doctors of physical therapy working on their PhD in neuroscience. And it was just, you couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting a PhD in our lab. And the thing was, like, here I am with my bachelor's degree. I was co-director of our lab, but but they didn't care. They would go, well, so what's your degree? Well, I have a bachelor's degree. And they go, oh, well, I know everything that you know. So I had been at it. At that point, it would have been about nine years I was at it. And these people coming into the lab, they, they were running their first studies in stroke recovery. They didn't really know what they were doing. They hadn't read our research. I mean, it was kind of weird. It was a weird situation. So I started, I was writing a, a column in a, a trade magazine for physical therapy called From the Lab. I was writing a column called From the Lab. And one of my columns one month was about 10 ideas that stroke survivors can use to catapult, to push forward their own recovery. So I got this idea that I should write a book that was 101 things that stroke survivors could do to help themselves recover, a kind of DIY recovery book. Okay. So, and, but, but then, you know, I got to about maybe 40 ideas and I realized I wasn't going to be able to make 101. There weren't 101 ideas that I could think of that was showed up in clinical research. It had to be supported in the clinical research for me to include it in a book. Okay. So I, I started writing this thing and, you know, I'm still getting heat from people at work who think they know more than me. So anyway, it was a great day when the book got published and uh, I was able to hand it out to my colleagues and they went, oh, maybe this guy does know a thing or two. So it was all about revenge. That's why <laughs> I wrote it. I wrote it for revenge. And it didn't take long for that book to become the best-selling book, at least on Amazon, in terms of stroke recovery. So if you if you go to Amazon, you type in stroke recovery, usually it's the first book that comes up. Absolutely. And in the various communities that I'm a part of now, uh, whether on Facebook or elsewhere or uh, support groups in the real world, there are two books that people always uh, suggest stroke survivors read, uh, Stronger After Stroke and uh, Dr. J Dr. Jill Taylor's book, uh, My Stroke of Insight. You know, the two of you are pretty much the celebrity authors in the stroke space now. So what's that experience been like? Well, you know, it's hard being a celebrity, Bill. <laughs> I try to deal with it by um, the way Jim Curry does. Uh, I, I just try to paint and do Zen Buddhism because it's too much pressure. I walk out of my house and it's like, look, it's the guy from Strong After Stroke. This is incredible. <sighs> You know, every once in a while, I do a talk and I try to sell my book during my talks. Sometimes I do a talk to 100 people. Nobody buys the book. Other times I go and there's 30 people there and 10 people will buy the book. And sometimes there's a line to get me to sign the book. And boy, do I feel like a celebrity. Um, look, I take, it, I take it seriously that people come to me for answers. And so um, I don't think of it as celebrity. It's, it's just such a joy to be able to set somebody on, uh, on their own vision quest. I mean, just like you, prior to your stroke, you were on a variety of vision quests. Anytime somebody can kind of map out that situation for you a little bit, um, that's just a great, it's a great joy to be able to help people with stuff like that. So if there's any celebrity, I don't know, but if there's um, a, an ability to help people, um, you know, anybody who's had a stroke survivor, you can always contact me and I'll do what I can to kind of show you the path as I, as I see it, given uh, the set of um, symptoms and sequelae that you have. And I just, I'm humbled by, um, you know, that anybody's even interested in these ideas. It's just, it's great fun. <laughs> 
Awesome. Awesome. So, I mean, the book now is in its third edition, or at least that's the version sitting on my table over here. Uh, what have been some of the most important changes in the book since the first edition? Wow, that's a great question. Um, so it's got a lot, I would say it's, it's increased in detail. So we know more about the brain functions, how the brain functions. We know more about recovery. I've been able to define things that didn't exist in the clinical research prior, like aforementioned uh, 1,200 repetitions. I'm trying to think of some of the other main things. I feel like pulling out a book and seeing. <laughs> but it's a great question. It's just gotten more granular, more detailed, and... I think that's where I'm going to leave that one. I'm kind of stymied by that question. It's a great question. But, um, but yeah, I think there's just more detail, more research. And, you know, it's one thing if you say X works because I have a study in front of me that says X works. But if you have 15 studies in front of you that says X works, now you can get get behind it. I think the other thing is that I've learned from doing talks, hundreds and hundreds of talks to clinicians, how to better express these very complex and dense issues in a way that's simple, but not so simple that it falls apart. So um, maybe it's a combination of more research and a better way of expressing these ideas. So it sounds like it's more about refinements and fleshing out what's already in there rather than any significant changes in the concepts or approaches. I, I would say that's that's true. Although I should point out that every time the publisher comes to me and says, are you ready to do a new edition? They also say, what do you got that's new? Because we can't just repackage it at the same old, as the same old book. And uh, Sure. I th and I think for publishers yeah. who keep coming back and saying, we can't just republish the same, the, the same thing with just minor tweaks. We need stuff that's new. I think those publishers, uh, somebody needs to talk to them about how there are uh, more than 800,000 people, 800,000 people having strokes in the U.S. every year. And so their customer base is ever expanding. That's true. Yeah, unfortunately. You know, there are quite a few, um, it's about 800,000 strokes per year. I'm just looking at the notes for, for the next edition. Um, one of them is, I mentioned already today, is action observation. This idea that if you look at somebody moving well, you will, that portion of the brain lights up. And it looks like the research says that it will hypertrophy that portion of your brain if you just watch somebody walking. So that that was a big one. Um, that is very cool. And is that does that uh, require that they be in person, or does uh, video work as well? Right. So if it's an fMRI study, understand it can't be in person. It's right, got to right. be a video, right? Because you got this big magnet around you. So it's all mm -hmm. it's video. Yep, video, which, absolutely. Which means that one of the key elements of improving walking and therapy is also one of the key elements for mitigating the spread of COVID-19, which is to, at some point, just stay home and watch Netflix. Right. Watch Good Walkers on Netflix. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, as a musician, my, my favorite band uh, ever is Led Zeppelin and the great um, John Henry Bonham was the drummer. And I you know, I wouldn't go on stage in front of a lot of people unless I watched videos of this guy play drums for about 20 minutes. And here's what happens. If you imagine doing a movement, the muscles involved in that movement fire. They just fire very minutely. It can be picked up on electromyography, but it can't be picked up like if you, you touch it, uh, if you were to touch the muscle. Um, not only do they fire, but they fire in the same order and for the same duration as if you actually do the movement. And this is the beauty of mental practice. It turns out that if you observe somebody doing a movement, the muscles that you think should go into that movement also fire minutely, as well as the brain firing minutely. So that's just a great example of something that I want to add into the next uh, edition. But I've opened up the document, and I can tell you everything that's going to be in there. Well, at least some of them 
<laughs> and every day I add to this list, so there's going to be sure. quite, a, quite a few th new things. Uh, so, I mean, we're we're uh, just about out of time yeah. here today. What's the most important thing that you want survivors to know? So, one of the questions I tried to answer, in, and this was in a subsequent edition. It didn't show up in the first one, but showed up later on. How does a stroke survivor know when they're done recovering? And that point is the point at which you're having so much fun living your life that going to rehab uh, it is not on your to-do list. Okay, So it's, it's a ballparking of it. Uh, that, first of all, that's not to say that you shouldn't be in the gym every day. I mean, everybody needs to work out every day in some way. So that, that builds, you talk about neuro fatigue. That's a real thing. You got to bank energy so that you can live your life. Everything that a stroke survivor does takes twice as much energy as the rest of us. So you got to be able to be in the gym every day do, doing something. But that doesn't, I'm not talking about recovery there. I'm just talking about building up your lungs, building up your muscles so that you can live your life. But having said that, having said that, um, there's going to be a point at which, hey, I've had it with rehab per se. Maybe I'll work on a few things, but I'm really, I'm, I'm back at work. You know, I'm raising my kids. I'm running my business. So I don't really need rehab per se. But for the people that haven't reached that point, my big message is, don't give up because if you if you stress the brain enough, it will grow dendrites, it will grow synaptic connections, and we're not sure what the parameters are yet. Nobody knows. There's an old saying in neuroscience, if we knew what the brain went through to pick up and drink out of a glass of water, we would be about 100 years ahead of where we are now. Hmm. So you know, we're just scratching the surface of the brain probably not the best metaphor, but, <laughs> but we're just getting the ideas uh, in order. In the meantime, lots of practice, lots of repetitive practice, lots of imagery, uh, mental practice, anything that you can do uh, to kind of head yourself in the right direction. And don't expect miracles. Don't make the perfect the, enem the enemy of the good. Just try to chip away at your present active ranges of motion. Because why not? What else are you going to do? Give up? No, not if you haven't gone back to living the life that you want. Don't give up. Yet. And that brings us to our hack of the week. I'm going to tell you something that some of my family members don't even know. So I was diagnosed in January with uh, motor neuron disease. And one of the things I've developed recently is a foot drop. So I'm going to go based on my own experience, not having anything to do with stroke necessarily, but definitely foot drop. So um, I have this strap that is a, and it's, it's an elastic strap and it has Velcro on both sides. So it sticks to itself. It's about a foot and a half long. It goes from the last shoelace on my shoe. That is the shoelace closest to the toes, wraps around the ankle and then goes back to itself. If you can imagine that. So it's, it's almost like if you had a rubber band that you were to tie around your ankle, that provides just enough dorsiflexion that I don't have to worry about, at least in the short term, an AFO or something like that. All it is is a, what do they call this? Like a stretchy, it's like a stretchy thing with Velcro on both sides that goes around the last shoelace and around the ankle once. It's super easy to put on and... Of course, I don't want anybody to try that idea and then fall and blame me. But I think it's there's something there. And if somebody wants to market that, I would buy it. I had to make it. And my wife sewed it together for me. Um, but yeah, so there's my hack of the week. I mean, Pete, this has been absolutely fantastic. If folks want to know more about you and what you're up to, where should they go? Okay, so the best way to find out stuff is if you go to Google... That's at do that's at google.com. If you go to Google and you type in stronger after stroke blog, I'll be the first hit, I think. And then um once you're there, you can find my email address and you can find a whole bunch of free resources for stroke survivors and you can go into the clinical research that's on seminar stuff. Um but you can always email me strongerafterstroke at yahoo 
and uh, I'll be <laughs> glad to help you out and head you in the right direction. Bill, I had a ball. This was super fun. One thing I really like about Pete's approach to stroke recovery is how focused he is on research and science. I mean, there are a lot of dubious treatments out there offered by people who don't have the science in place, but are more than happy to take your money. Pete doesn't do that. With grounding his approach and recommendations in the actual research and speaking out against unfounded approaches, he really is on the side of survivors. One of the big takeaways from this episode is the power of visualization and observation. Pete points out that the research has shown that we can activate the parts of our brain responsible for walking by walking and doing our exercises, which, you know, we is absolutely what we would expect. But the research also tells us that we activate the same region when we watch people walk, or even when we imagine walking ourselves. And in my personal experience, I found it helpful to do this with my hand, to imagine and visualize moving my index finger. And it certainly seemed to help, seemed that I got some more movement back in that finger ahead of others just because I would lie in bed at night with my hand under the blanket and just imagine raising that index finger. And in fact, even as I talk about it right now, I can feel that index finger starting to move. So what can you do with this information? Obviously, talk with your doctor or your medical team about your exercise program before you engage in one. But when you do go out, walk. And when you need a rest, sit down and watch people walk. If you watch musicians perform, take in the music, but also watch their hands and fingers, whether you're seeing a live performance or you're watching this on TV. Focus on observing their movements, not, not necessarily because you want to duplicate what Amy Mann can do with a bass guitar, but to just sort of soak in those movements and watch those fingers move. If you find yourself waiting for an appointment or whatever, take some time and just visualize your leg, your foot, arm, or your hand just moving. Imagine moving those fingers even if they don't actually move. If it's language you struggle with, watch others speak. Actively listen to them speak. Maybe that's, that's more challenging in the era of masks, but you can certainly watch folks on video and listen to podcasts. And if you have recordings of yourself from before the stroke, listen to and, and watch those. I mean, in this case, I may be getting ahead of the science here, so definitely take that for what it's worth. But remember, it, it's free. It's harmless, and it doesn't interfere with other therapies, so it may be worth a shot. Observation and visualization are always free, and I can't imagine how they wouldn't be safe. So go ahead and give it a try while you're doing the other things your doctors recommend. I also think Pete's background as a musician is especially interesting. Uh especially in light of the conversation I had with Brian Harris from Med Rhythms just a couple of months ago. Music gives us different access to language. The, rib the rhythm in music can help reset our gait and our other rhythmic activities, and the repetitive practice that musicians do to become better are all things that help stroke survivors return to or obtain the life that we now want. The title of Pete's book is also worth thinking about. I mean, do you feel you are stronger after stroke? In many respects, I do. Obviously not in my left arm or my left leg yet, but in other ways. Uh, in the creativity I've had to develop to get things done. In, in the clarity about how to deal with obstacles. And in knowing that I could go through this experience and then come out the other side. And in the strength of the survivors, the caregivers, and the professionals that sort of really make up this community. I mean, that to me is really what it means to be stronger after stroke. So check out Pete's book and blog, both named Stronger After Stroke. You can find those links over at strokecast.com slash strongerafterstroke. To get better, 
continue practicing and doing those exercises your PT, OT, and SLP recommended. And if you think you've reached a plateau, try some different exercises and keep going. Share this episode with someone you know by giving them the link strokecast.com slash stronger after stroke. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you soon. The Strokecast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Strokecast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network.